Ads, schmads. If you don't want ads, that's okay. Choose the Dave McWilliams Plus option on Apple Podcasts. And hey, presto, no ads. To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by Acast. How are you doing there? It is, as you know, the podcast time. We're discussing uh, at our advanced ages the things that we may or may not get up to in the next couple of years. And John is licking frogs in an Amazonian jungle. Excuse me. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Broken my ticket. <laughs> we are going to get very serious now. We're going to very serious. We're going to talk all about John America, the American election. It wasn't the retail end, it's now the business end. We're getting yeah. down to business now. And of course, Joe Biden. Everyone's saying he's demented, he's got dementia. Licking frogs. He's licking frogs. <laughs> Joe should lick a few frogs. He can sit there. He can sit there in the jungle. No, but you know, let's be serious. Joe Biden, everyone's saying it's not an age thing, it's a dementia thing. And we are going to the States in two seconds to talk to the brilliant Pippa Malgram. Pippa Malgram's dad, think about this. Her dad was JFK's advisor. She was George W's advisor. This is a real American political family legacy, the whole thing. But what we want to focus on is the idea that Americans are in an election year. And over the last 20 odd years, John, people have come out of nowhere to win the elections. People yeah. are being dismissed, you know, candidates. And we're going to talk about Robert F. Kennedy, yeah. who everybody, I think it's fair to say in Ireland, even in Ireland where the Kennedys are golden, says, dismisses, like, who's this geezer? What's his thing? But he, ha he has a bad name. Like, like I've been, haven't been following him as such. You know, I follow American politics, but his name keeps popping up. And uh, in actual fact, he was a heroin addict, this guy, yeah. way back in the day. And, you know, he's it, being dismissed as a bit of an anti-vaxxer and a bit of a loon and all the rest. But actually, I'm not sure if that's quite the case. Exactly. So let's go to Boston. Let's go right away to Boston, to MIT. Let's talk to Pippa Malgram, an amazing economist, always has her finger on the pulse of American politics. And let's get the Kennedy story. Pippa, how are you? Lovely to see you. How are you? You too. It's wonderful to see you. And it was fun going drinking with you when I was in Ireland last week. <laughs> yes, yes, it was. Yes, it was. Shh. Okay, let's keep that down. We were in the long hall. The long hall. The long, the long, hall. The long, hall. long, the long yes. hall. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but, but let's talk about America, right? Let's talk about this. Well, is a wait, massive, can I just massive, interrupt? Massive, massive, yeah. Go, go, go. Just, just one thing, because the reason I was in Ireland is I was speaking at the CFA, and those guys were like, "You've got to give us a shout out and say the dinner was amazing," which it was. So, okay, I'm done. the CFA Thank dinner you. shout out was amazing. <laughs> Next time, invite John and I. We will be back. Absolutely, back. we'll be in the cheap seats. We're happy to be in the cheap seats. It's all good. People will give the, the keynote address. <laughs> all will be fine. Tell me about the United States, because. I'm reading at the moment, and all the stuff is about Joe Biden, about his mental health, about dementia, about age. Trump is the unassailable Republican candidate. So yeah. let's talk about Boston. Let's talk about Kennedy. What is going yeah. on with this Robert Kennedy? Because we're not seeing him, and you're telling me he is actually polling amazingly well. Amazingly well. So let's back up a little bit. Yeah. Because the question is, for a candidate who's, now got the highest approval ratings, who's out fundraising both Trump and Biden per capita, like not including corporates, but per person. And there's a groundswell that is, it's unlike anything I've seen since the young came out for Obama. This is, but this is on a bigger, but much bigger scale. And the elderly are also coming out for Kennedy. So the question of why isn't it being reported? And I think the main reason, and this is a very cynical view, but he has a very fundamental position on the corporate capture of the regulatory system in America and particular focus on pharmaceuticals. So he has said if he becomes president, he's going to make pharma advertising on television illegal, which, by the way, it wow. is in every country in the world except the U.S. and New Zealand. And so... Most of the big news agencies depend on pharma advertising for their business model, right? CNBC, CNN. 
So if he wins, this is an existential issue for those news agencies. They may be out of business because they don't have an alternative source of revenue. So they either say it's, he's a zero, we just don't even report him as if he's not there, or he's crazy. Yeah. And the crazy allegation comes around him being a, quote, anti-vaxxer. But when I started to really look into it, I realized, you know, his position is the government shouldn't be mandating an untested vaccine. And, you know, now we're starting to get all the data back from the COVID vaccine, and it's it's not all good, right? So the view is if the pharma companies actually pay for the regulatory salaries, then it really doesn't make sense that they should be allowed to mandate. You can offer a vaccine. You can seriously encourage everyone should take it. But to make it required, he's like, we should draw a line. And actually, at this point, most Americans agree with that. So this is an interesting reason why you haven't heard about him. Also, he's drawing equally from both sides. He's taking an equal number of voters away from Trump and from Biden. See, initially, the Biden team thought he was only going to take votes from Trump. So that was fine. Yeah. But now we have a totally different situation. So that's that's how Kennedy comes into this race. And let me just say right now up front, the risk here is not that he throws the election to either Biden or Trump. The risk here now is that we could end up with a hung electoral college with a three way split that means no one wins. Explain that to me, because I want to yeah. go back to Camelot. I want to go back to the Kennedy myth. This is yeah. an Irish podcast. The Kennedys are the most yeah. famous Irish family. So I want to go back there in a second, but explain Where? to me the mechanics. So what we're seeing, and I would be very much a recipient of the news that you're describing. So I see Trump, I see Biden. I'm not hearing anything about Kennedy. What you're saying is, is, is he polling 10%? Is he polling 11%? Where is he in the in, in, in the polls? Well, right now we have some showing him being neck and neck. So 33, 33, and 33 for no Biden wow. and Kennedy. Yes. And he's got the highest approval ratings of all of them. And I'm telling you, there's something extraordinary here happening. Now, the establishment in Washington, who I know well, they are in denial about this. They are like, there's just no way this, what they call no label third party yep. candidate can happen because no third party candidate, no independent has ever done very well in a US election. But here's what's changed. In the Gallup polls, it's showing that something between 49% and 65% of Americans have already left either the Democrat or Republican Party, and now identify as independent. Wow. Now, we've never seen this in American history. So there's a real possibility now that this independence movement, actually, they're fine voting for an independent. Wow. So, and so the, under the Constitution, you have to win 270 votes to be president. But when you start doing the math, throwing Kennedy in, it looks like... Biden would only have to lose 37 electoral college votes versus the last time. And suddenly we have a hung election where no one wins. No one gets that 270. And if no one gets the 270, then we go to a whole different election procedure that even I don't understand. It's really complicated. But the Senate makes a decision. The House makes a decision. And it's not based on the weightings of the states anymore. It's just based on one vote per state. And it's basically a free for all. So that's why I'm saying this is a Yikes. really dramatic new situation that people have not understood because they've been dismissing Kennedy. And yet Kennedy is what you're saying. He's connecting with young people, with old people, with rural people, with urban people. And what you believe, and this is fascinating, that the reason he hasn't been covered by the mainstream and dismissed by the mainstream, is this pharma angle? I think that is the, the main reason. I think it's the best description of what accounts for this complete blank on something that's a bigger groundswell than we had under Obama. And, and how big are 
the pharma companies in terms of funding either yeah. Democrats or Republicans? Oh, they fund everybody. Right. By, by the mean, way, shh, they fund Ireland too. <laughs> just, true, just true. Little, you know. we, are, we, are, we are the biggest ma- makers of Viagra. We are yeah. the biggest makers of silicon implants in the world. Yes. We've like, boobs and cocks, that's us. <laughs> Important stuff. I didn't know that. It's true, it's true. Important by stuff. Way, and I'm not- I'm not. I'm not in the camp that's like condemning the pharma companies. And, you know, they do. They, they do what they do. But the bottom line is, there is a business imperative that begins to explain to us why there's a disinclination for the mainstream media to report the story that I'm explaining. And and to be clear, we have been here before. I remember I wrote a paper. I think it was for the Evening Standard in. London back in 2015 saying there's a really good chance that Trump could win. I remember that and everyone thought you were a loon. Yeah, exactly. Like you are completely insane. And just to be clear, this was not a preference. It was just a prediction, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could see the forces at work. And I was like, holy moly. I mean, we really could end up with Trump. Then we did. So this, what I'm saying now, I know sounds radical, but we've been here before. So this is not so wildly crazy if you look at the the pathway that's brought us here. So let's explain. Okay, so I don't know much about Robert F. Kennedy, only that he is Bobby Kennedy's son. Who is this guy? Explain to me. What's he all about? Well, he's also John F. Kennedy, President John F. Kennedy's nephew. Yes, So he grew up with, I think he was about 14 years old when both his uncle, the president of the United States, and his father, the campaigning uh, potential president of the United States, were both assassinated. And so in the American public memory, there's a kind of massive soft spot for this young man at a tender age, right at the cutting edge of history, losing his core family members. But then he disappeared off of the radar for many years. And interestingly, ended up at one point, maybe 25 or 30 years ago, as a fisherman on the Hudson River. And I mean, he was fishing, a professional fisherman. You know, he'd inherited money, but he worked in, you know, blue collar jobs. So he kind of left the whole Washington establishment thing behind. And in that work, he started to realize that there were some big corporates dumping toxic waste into the Hudson River. And at that point, the Hudson River was literally dead. From New York City north, there was no I can imagine, yeah. Um, You know, this would have been the 70s. And so he and the other fishermen started campaigning. And over the course of the next 20 years or so, they just cleaned up and have now restored the Hudson and it is now full of wildlife again. And so he became a, a campaigner activist. And then he started to get into lots of other areas. Pharmaceuticals was one of them. But he's also been a defender of children's rights. So he's one of the very few activists, like a kind of Ralph Nader type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, what I was going to say was a Nader type, yeah. Is a Nader type, but... Because of his father and his uncle, he understood a lot about how politics worked. And so he saw this opening and started to campaign. And it's been a grassroots campaign, I have to say. It's like a guerrilla campaign. Because most campaigns in America are all driven by corporate or big yeah. institutional money. This is totally driven by small donations by individuals. And one reason that the pollsters can't track it is, and they, I've talked to them, they've said, because there are so many Kennedy supporters that have never been involved in politics. So we don't even know their phone numbers to do the polling on them. It's okay. a whole new community. So, But at the same time, I just want to be clear, because now I've made him sound very left wing, which actually he isn't. His position is he's a Bill Clinton type Democrat, meaning he is pro business, but his definition is we ought to support the entrepreneurs because they're building the economy of tomorrow. So let's not tax them too hard. But major corporates that are paying zero, well, that's not right. And we should fix that. He also has very libertarian values. So he basically says, look, Government should leave you alone once you get home. So, you know, this invasive approach on 
abortion, on drug use, as in illegal drug yep. use or homeopathic drug use, all that stuff. We should have some rules around that that protect your right as an individual within your own life. And so but do what you want. Yeah, it, it's kind of an old fashioned Republican position, like a pre Reagan, weirdly. So he's super centrist and that's why he's pulling from both sides. And also he was his position is we should talk to each other again. We should stop this warring between the left and the right. We've got to find common ground. And I remember Pierce Morgan tried very hard to beat him up on a uh, show that he was doing. And he said, you know, you go on Fox News and you meet with Trump. So you're a traitor to the Democrat Party, which he was a Democrat at that time. And he said very calmly, well, how can you persuade your opponents if you don't speak to them? Right. We need yeah, that. So he's, simple- beautiful, yeah. so he's got good lines. So he's polling. He's being ignored. There's a grassroots movement. Is it, is it, do you remember the original Bernie campaign, just little small amounts of money? The reason I yep. mentioned Bernie is I am interviewing Bernie next Thursday night, John, and you and I are going to be there in UCD. Indeed. He's coming, he's coming up for it. But is it a Bernie style campaign without the left rhetoric? Is that what we're looking at? Yes. Imagine a Bernie style campaign stroke Obama style campaign using the most modern technology as well. And let me say this, this is really important. Nobody talks about this, but Every presidency is associated with a new technology. Interesting. Explain that to me. Yeah. So President Clinton, Bill Clinton, won on television. Remember yes. Saturday Night Live? He played the, the saxophone. saxophone. I remember that. That was yes. the moment, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the moment he really won. Obama won on YouTube. And his campaign contributions all came through YouTube at a time when nobody understood what the heck a YouTube was. Yep. And it took the establishment by surprise. Then we had Trump who won on Twitter at a time when people didn't get what was Twitter. Mm. How does that work? Why is that important? So every presidency has a has a technology. I think today there are two particular technologies that are helping Kennedy. One is podcasts, just exactly what we're doing now. And this is where most of the public is listening and on a podcast. And I would say the iconic moment for Kennedy of this campaign was when Joe Rogan had him on for three hours and 30 million people listened to it, which is a vastly larger audience than you'll ever get on any mainstream media. And the thing is with podcasts, as we're doing right now, it's no longer Twitter, which was originally that 120 characters yes. where everything's slammed into a, basically a punch, right? Yes. This is a more long form, elegant, civilized, nuanced. You can get into detail, show your breadth. Um, people get a sense of your personality. And so I think the podcast uh, format is the key. And then I would add Instagram. And Instagram is where you really see what the Kennedy campaign is about. And the kids are all watching it, meaning anybody under 30. And all the polls are showing he wins hands down outright now with under 35s and nearly with under 45 year olds. That's amazing. That really amazing. is amazing. It is amazing. But you can understand why people miss it when they, they miss Twitter, they missed YouTube, and now they're missing this. Mm. That's absolutely fascinating because, again, you know, for, for us, there's there's two or three degrees of which American politics for non-Americans are interesting. Number one, <laughs> biggest country in the world, major superpower. We get all that. But there's also the drama and the theatre of American elections, mm. okay? And the money and the razzmatazz and the Wall Street and the Hollywood and the Silicon Valley and the, the whole American shebang, right? But what you're saying to me, and it's really fascinating, is that there is a wild card, that Trump was a wild card. Yes. Obama was a wild card. We forget that. We forget it. Obama came out of nowhere. This is actually a key, key point we have to think about. So everybody keeps betting on the known candidate. But if you look back at our past five or six presidents, so, you know, I I worked for George W. Bush. I remember that. Right? Now, nobody thought he was going to win. Everybody thought it was going to be his brother, Jeb. Yes. Right. Mm. And before that, 
Clinton, no one had ever even heard of him three years before he became president. Before he became Slick Willie. Do you remember, remember Slick Willie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. So Clinton came out of nowhere and won. Like within three years, suddenly he's president. George W., people are like, that's not possible. And boom, suddenly the dark horse candidate is winning. Obama, nobody heard of Obama a few years before he became president. Trump, no one thought that now, was possible. We heard of him, but we just, there's no way this no guy could win. Way. Right. So we only have one president out of all of those presidents that actually was the expected candidate, which is Biden. And that is arguably only because people didn't want Trump. Yes. It wasn't pro Biden. It was a it was the no never Trumper vote. So what if we continue with the same thing that we love electing somebody you never heard of? It, this should not be a surprise. So, you, so you're, you're what you're saying to me now is it's 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 not a mainstream forecast. It's an idea. It's a suggestion that Robert Kennedy could win this election, or could the do sufficiently is- well to upset everything. Yeah, was, that would be my point. Not it, you can't really win the electoral college. This is not going to happen. But he can be such a disruptor. And that's the way to think of it. He's a disruptor to traditional politics that the Electoral College itself may not deliver 270 votes to any single candidate, which then throws the whole country into a completely new election process that even I don't understand. I got to study it because we've not seen this before. Right. What happens? Nobody gets 270 votes. Pippa, like what does RFK Jr. have to do? to win over. I mean, apart from, like, if he changed his stance on pharma, is he a shoe-in then? No, but his policies on other fronts are proving to be very popular. So let's go through a few of them. On foreign policy, he says, we should be leading with ideas, not with bullets. So we should cut a deal with the Russians. We should not be spending all this money in Ukraine. We need that money at home to build the domestic economy. Now, this is super resonating with the young who don't want to be reeled into a big conflict. The Biden position has been the opposite. It's been send in the aircraft carriers to the Middle East. It is we have to fight with the Russians. We have to, you know, Actually, can I, can I, can I just stop you there? Where is it on Israel? Because again, Europeans do not understand the American support of Israel, which even last night I was out with a bunch of fellas who are not political and the conversation zeroed in on Israel and what every European, almost everyone looks at as a genocide. We're like, you cannot, they're killing children all the time and America is supporting them. So this is where the American youth are also asking this question, saying, wait, what what are we doing exactly? And this is a big problem for the Biden administration because the Jewish vote in America is very powerful, very influential. And of course, you know, pro-Israel. So he had to be tough on this question and align with Israel for domestic political reasons, in addition to whatever philosophical reasons. But now he's finding that many other voters are saying, wait, the position is not measured, right? And so yeah. bottom line is it's splitting the Democratic Party apart. That's that's the fundamental bottom line, which is why Biden keeps increasingly waffling on this as he tries to bring both sides to him, but in fact, he's not when he's losing both. The pro-Israel lobby is like, you're not tough enough. And the people asking questions about how measured is this are also saying you're being too tough. So he, in a way, can't win either. And that's a big problem for the Democratic. And has Kennedy mentioned this? Is Kennedy like, so Ukraine is quite simple, right? You have pro-Russian pro-democracy. It's a very simple gig and Americans kind of line up on either side and have historically lined up against the Russians, okay? Uh, Middle East, very different. And is Kennedy yeah. is Kennedy mentioning this? Is it he important? is, and he's taking a very pro-Israel position, but an anti-war position. And this is the key point that he keeps making, is that you can be tough 
without having to bring in tanks, troops. There are other ways. And if we were better at diplomacy, if we were better at managing these situations before they exploded into a problem, then we would have fewer problems. Now, whether that's true or not is an open question, but that's but resonating. It's, it, it's, re it's resonating. Oh. At this stage, it's what resonates. It's it's what's catching. Yeah. You know, it, you know, you can you can you can you know, it's it's, it's the old adage. You basically you you campaign in, in poetry and you govern in prose. And, and oh, so, I love that. Yeah, well, it's Never true. You know, that. like you can, yeah, listen on this podcast. You Irish are so lyrical. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> So, so Pippa, just give me, give me, because again, Kennedy's an unknown, as you say, he's been dismissed, and the the general view here is, yeah, he's a Kennedy, he's got the name, but people say, oh, but he's a bit of a loon, he's a bit. Like, give me his top line five sort of policies, ideas, urges. They're kind of urges that are hitting with people. So the number one issue, political issue in America since the 50s has been clean water. Everybody forgets this. And he's that's maybe one of his most hardcore stances. He talks about no more forever chemicals in the water. So that is resonating across the across board, the board. All ages, everywhere. That's one. The no more forever wars, that's also resonating. I have to say a smaller one, but a very interesting one, is his position on what are currently illegal drugs. So number one, he said, everybody who's in prison on minor marijuana charges, we got to let them all out. This is just crazy, especially now that so many states have marijuana yeah, ex legal. Yeah, of course. Now that is John, very John is stoned half the time here doing this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Don't believe a word of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But why is this important? Because honestly, who is that? That will be young African-Americans statistically. Yeah. Now, Politico magazines has already said that Robert F. Kennedy is the most trusted white man in black America. And I think that is true. And that's partly the Kennedy family legacy of involvement with civil rights. But it's partly because of this position that I want to let all these young people out who are incarcerated on, you know, and this bullshit is just little ideas. Work. Yeah, stupid ideas. Yeah, yeah super Plus, misdemeanors. He, he gets into then the prison system in America is currently run on a profitability basis. Yes. So you basically get paid to have more prisoners. He's like, this is crazy. We have to stop this. So that's another one. Again, it's not a major one, but it's there. And then on drugs itself, and remember, he is a former drug user and was arrested at one point on heroin possession. And he had a very dark period in his life. And you would, like, in my lifetime, I never thought we could have someone who'd been a heroin user being a presidential candidate. But the thing is, the young today who are experimenting, as you know, you, we all know with teenagers, right? He has said, look, we know for sure that certain things are useful for PTSD and for depression, like psychedelics, psilocybin. Yep. He said, we should let the medical community do that research and, and allow it to go forward. Again, pharma is opposed to that because they don't want competing alternatives. The young are like, yeah, we agree. Yep. So that also, it's not a major campaign Yeah, but issue. the little things that are adding up. It's a resonating issue. So those are some of the, th I think the being a true environmentalist, you know, everybody else can talk about environmental protection, but he's the only one with the chops who's really done the work. And again, I don't want to, I'm not here because I'm a, you know, Robert F. Kennedy supporter. I'm here because as an economist, like I said, when I identified that Trump really did have a chance of winning, even though I was not in agreement with a lot of his policy stances, but you have to be open to reality. Yeah. And I, what I see is that we consistently keep being in denial of reality. You know, the Buddhists always say that, you know, suffering happens when you have an argument with reality. And that is what we're doing in politics, no matter who is the candidate. We keep having this argument. And that's why I'm raising this, you know, left field candidate. Again, it's it was interesting before. Now, if the, if he prevents either Trump or Biden from winning those 270 votes, he will be a historic figure. This is a whole different ballgame. And the Kennedys like being historic figures? 
Well, and they are, right? They yeah. always are. And, you know, back to the Camelot. That's why, you know, when I said to you, when we started to talk about this podcast, how is it no one in Ireland is following this? The Irish are Kennedy supporters. So I could be very interested to see how the Irish respond. Well, there's 44 million Irish Americans. That's a lot of voters. And, you know, although Biden, Trump goes on about his Irishness, nobody is as Irish American as a Kennedy. Totally. Now, let us talk before we go on the American economy, because the American economy yeah. has been unbelievably annoying for economists, right? I mean, I, not for me. I know, but I've you're always, that. you're always, you're, you're the, probably the best forecaster I have ever, ever come across. You get everything right. So everyone said, oh, it's going to go into recession. It's going to be stagflation. It's, no. it's going to be this. Talk to me. Tell me what's going on. Well, well, well. So to be clear, I am the one who said back in 2015, inflation is coming back and geopolitics will come with it. And remember, at that time, everyone's like, inflation is dead. It's never coming back. And we won the Cold War. So geopolitics isn't going to be an issue. So that's where I was. But I also argued that the amount of money that had been thrown into the U.S. and the world economy because of the bailout from the financial crisis was so huge that you can't have a recession. Because like there's, there's just too much cash much, around. Yeah, like it simply won't happen. So I've been on the optimistic side, um, and I'm a big believer that, look, what, what you're always dealing with is a race between inflation and innovation. And innovation in the U.S. happens so quickly. And that's, again, why am I here at MIT? Because this is the cutting edge of innovation. And that holds prices and inflation down. And it stimulates um, growth. And yep. so I, that's part of the reason I've actually just moved back to Washington, D.C., because I think the U.S. economy is so strong. It's so innovative. It's so quick to respond. Plus, I wanted a front row seat on what I think is going to be a truly historic election. Um, but even when we have uh, tumultuous politics, people just go, OK, well, I'm doubling down on running my business. Right. They, they get more focused on being more efficient with their work here. So, uh, yeah, it's hard to bet against the U.S. economy. So over the course of the next 18, 24 months, we're going to see slightly higher interest rates because the economy is at full employment. It is at well, full employment or close to. People are betting on rate cuts at this point because inflation is falling and it is falling. And so. So you're going to get this uh, ideal combination. You're going to get growth and disinflation. I'd add one more thing in, too, which is, you know, I don't want to ignore all the structural problems. And we do have a horrific budget deficit, overall current account deficit. But here's the funny thing. What's the fastest growing component of the labor market in the United States? The over 55 year olds. And so as older people say, you know what, I'm going to live till I'm 90 because of medical advances. Do I really want to do nothing during that whole time? Actually, now because of all these new apps on my phone and AI, I chat GPT-3, I can create businesses. I can work as an advisor to my old employer. And so basically, if the older 55s go back to work, then the entitlement problem pressures on the budget, they all go down. So actually, we kind of solve problems, not maybe entirely, but we certainly put things in a better direction because people are just working longer and working better. Well, for Europeans, that is a profoundly traumatic prospect because we are used to, uh, as you know, retiring early, going to the South France, chilling out, going to McKenna's up the road. In fact, that's where John and I are just going now after this podcast. But Pippa, it is always a pleasure. Great to talk to you. Great to see you. Fantastic. Always. Thank you. I just think this is a humdinger of a story. Isn't it? But I kind of wonder, on one hand, is RFK coming up late to the game? Like, should he have kicked this off earlier? And should, you know, what I thought was really funny there, actually, was Joe Rogan having him on for three hours. Should yeah. we turn this into a three-hour podcast? Could you imagine? Exactly. <laughs> We'd have to go to the gym, John. We'd have to <laughs> shave our heads and go to the gym, right? But the only president that ever retired Right, was Lyndon Johnson. Mm. So Lyndon Johnson retired. So think about, so a lot of Democrats are saying, hold on a second. The only way we're going to win this thing 
mm. is if we get rid of Joe Biden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he can't win. Yeah. Right? He's popular. He's the granddad figure. He's the old uncle. He's all this. Past it. But he's, he's past, past it. He's too old. It's almost like elder abuse watching this. Yeah. And no, seriously, <laughs> asking this guy to be smart and savvy and quick. And his brain is. And it's a huge pressure job. Huge pressure job. So the only person who's ever, as a president, not run again was Lyndon Johnson. And he resigned in March of 1968. When mm -hmm. he was president. Mm. Think about the echoes of this. Who took up the reins? Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. Bobby Kennedy came through. I'm not saying Kennedy's a democratic person, but there's an echo of history. There's yeah. A, there's, as, as Seamus Heaney would say, now we're talking poetry. Yeah. It's rhyming. The history is rhyming. Bobby Kennedy gets assassinated in June of 1968. Yeah. But there is the echo that the Kennedys are there in the American consciousness. And you can't forget that name recognition, the idea people were saying, you know, the Kennedys have this dreamlike position in the American mind. Yeah. And if this guy's hitting all the right buttons, it could be the most amazing November, John. 5th of November, 2024. Could you imagine yeah. a Kennedy president? Or as you say, the Hong parliament, the Hong presidency. I, I think that would be just incredible. And I think if that happens, like the shit could really hit the fan. Yeah. But also, you know, change is positive. Change is always positive. It's nerve wracking, but it's positive. And I think a, a former heroin addict, fisherman on the Hudson River. Yeah. With Pat Trump. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> okay. We'll talk to you Thursday.